this is this is Sunday morning. We are at the bank of the Jordan River. We had a baptismal service where people are being baptized in the Jordan River. We're standing on the banks of the Jordan. Uh, it's a beautiful sight. People are being blessed. And Lots of flies. Yeah, more flies than you can imagine. But uh, we are being blessed. <laughs> So they send their love from Israel, from the banks of the Jordan. Ooh How's everybody this morning? All right, all right, all right. It's another great day. Great day to be alive. Great day to be in the house of God. One more time. <laughs> all right. Y'all ready for some word? Yes. All right, so today's message is not going to be a run, jump, shout, even though I'll never do one of them anyway. <laughs> Nor am I expecting a whole lot of amen, so I went ahead and amen myself about 100 times, so I won't feel like I'm missing anything. Um, but we're going to do something a little more practical today, uh, and we're going to discuss some things. Did you know that the general population as a whole, well, you should know the general population as a whole are not fans of church. And it's our fault. And today what we want to do is we want to look at the reasons as to why folks aren't coming and then why they have a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to church. Now, today is not a bash church day. OK, let me go ahead and put that out there. But what we need to do is take a real look and see what, what we're missing and how we can fix it, okay? Um, so if, if it was up to me, and it wasn't up to me, because, uh, you know, I sought counsel before I did, you know, safety in the multitude of counsel, right? But if it was up to me, I'd probably call this church sucks. But I know everybody ain't ready for that, so I ain't call it that. Because <laughs> I ain't want to offend some of you. But the reality is that most people's idea of church is that. We know this because we can have record-breaking crowds up the road at Dowdy Ficklin Stadium for a football game. Sellouts. I think they've had two sellouts this year, right? But then when it comes to Sunday morning and we come to church, sprinkles here and there. And then when we look at New Bern, a lot of those people in that stadium are from New Bern. But we're offering living water and we get handfuls in comparison. And what most people don't realize is that it is our responsibility to know where these people are that we are called to minister. But most churches, most Christians are okay with segregated success. What do you mean by segregated success? We have a million and one churches with 10, 15 people in it. And we happy as long as our stuff is good. We ain't going to worry about nothing and nobody else. As long as we can keep the lights on and church is pretty good, we're good. But we have a mandate from God to get involved in the world and what it's doing. And the only way we can do this is if we know what's keeping the world from getting involved with what God is doing. Honestly, there are some things uh, that we've done for years that we've made staples in the church that we got to talk about because they didn't feel like they could talk about it. They being the world don't feel like they can come in here and tell us right. their issues. And um, we're not going to talk about it. So then there's a, a big elephant in the room. It's the thing that we see on parodies and stuff like Saturday Night Live and anytime uh, somebody does a church scene in a movie, it's all exaggerated and it's got preachers being money hungry and it's got all these other things and we laugh at it and the world laughs at us and the world laughs at him Amen. and the sacrifice because there are things that we've done to legitimize some of the fears, hurts, frustrations that the world has about church. My goal is that we would be able to identify some of the things in our church, not just the universal church, but the local church as well. 
Um, so listen, until we are self-aware, until you know where you are, God can never do anything in your life. And so we're going to identify some of those things that are off-putting about church. But we're not going to just talk about it. We're going to become the solution. You see, until we become the solution, all we can do is complain about something that we're not willing to interact in. Amen. But God calls us to be the change. Yes. So let's look at some research that I found as to why people uh, view the church the way that they do. Um, I've been looking at some research in, done by the Barna Group. Uh, they do church uh, research for all kinds of Christians in America. And check these uh, statistics out. 70% of all churches in America are on the decline. Amen. Just to put that into perspective, there are over 150 churches in New Bern. There are about six churches within a four block radius of Dayspring alone. So that means 105 of these churches are losing members, are not being effective, and nobody's coming. They said that only two out of 10 how many millennials we got here? 38 and under, raise your hand. If you're 38 or younger, raise your hand. So here's the thing. Two out of 10 of y'all think church is important. So that means eight people out of every 10 in your generation do not think church is important at all. 39% say that church is not important because they can find God elsewhere. Listen to this, 35% say that church is not personally relevant to their life at all. They say there's nothing that happens in the hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half that we're in here uh, in this building that's relevant to any part of their life. 31% say that church is the most boring thing in the world. Church ought to be fun. Now this one here is crazy. 20% say it feels like God is missing from church when they come. The music, the lights, the programs are, are nice, but they don't feel the presence of God. Some deeper complaints go on to say that one third of 100% of these people that they interviewed uh, said their negative perceptions are a result of moral failures in leadership. How many of you have seen leaders that have failed morally? And this is why they're not coming. The survey goes on to say that 87% of Christians are judgmental. Amen. Now, this survey wasn't just taken by unbelievers. There were Christians in this survey, too. So we think we're judgmental. 85% are hypocritical. 91% are homophobic. 70% are insensitive to others. So when we look at this, we can't blame people for not wanting to come to church because they have enough stress and drama in their own lives without dealing with the mess that's going on in the church, too. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play a little game. I'm going to I'm, I'm ask you to raise everybody. Just raise your hand. OK, everybody, everybody. Put your hand up. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read some stuff. And if you've ever had this thought in your life, not just today, but ever had this thought in your life, put your hand down, okay? <laughs> you had a fear of being judged. Church was boring. This church is full of cliques. Wow. Now this one's going to wipe them all out. Church lasts too long. Oh, we still got a couple hands up. Okay, all right, all right, all right. They only preach about hell and damnation. They only want my money. I've been hurt in church before. I don't trust the pastor. This church is like a cult. We still got a few faithful holding on. They don't preach about Jesus. So, see, all hands gone. They go on and says, I hate church folks, but I love God. Church is one big show. They do very little for the community. I don't feel any closer to God after going. No one knows my name. The, they only care about the numbers. It feels like uh, rules and regulations are jail. 
they talk down to one another. It's fake. Church sucks. Some of us here in church have these thoughts and we're talking about those that we should be compelling. Now, this is a survey done with over 100,000 people. And this is what they say about the thing that God created. So now that we know, I believe God has given us a mandate to step into the light and say, this may have been your experience that you've had at some point or another, and it may be reality to you right now. But there's something different that God can do in your life. So my goal is to show how along with the body, uh, the, this body of believers uh, that we can start to change the narrative and what God planned for the local church. So we're going to take a look at Matthew 16, 13, Matthew 16, 13. And while y'all turning to that, I want you to see that God tells us in his word that we're supposed to go into all the world in Matthew 28, 19 and make disciples. And he also tells us in a parable in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it's called the parable of the great feast. And it says uh, to go out into the country and the highways and byways and in your social circles or areas of influence. And I want you to compel and urge people to come in because I want my house full. So God's talking about the church and how he wants people here, but there's obstacles and things that have happened and we have to figure out what the real intent of church is, and we are going to do that by reversing the narrative of church. And the title of this message today is The Reverse Church. Somebody say reverse church. Now what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, take what people think church is, and we're going to turn it around, and we're going to reverse the perception by looking at how God originally started the church. Somebody may have a problem with church, but they can't, they, if they come in contact with you or with me, uh, they, should see, they should see a difference. Amen. When they come in contact with us, they're going to meet the reverse church. Amen. The reverse church of what culture says church is, the reverse church of what has been done in the past, the reverse church of what leaders have done in the past, they're going to run into somebody that has found the real meaning that's contrary to culture. That's what Jesus did. He came and interrupted culture. They said it was supposed to be this way, and he reversed it. He said, you thought I was coming to take over Rome but I'm going to build an empire that's going to last forever and I don't need Cookie and Lucius to do it. Some of y'all will get that later. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good too. So, Matthew 16, 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? See, I love this because there's always going to be uh, some point in your spiritual journey where God does not care what everybody else is saying. He wants to know what you say about him. Do you believe me? Will you trust me? Can I, be a, can I be your provider? No matter if the world is tripping and saying whatever, who do you say that I am? So verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed, to you, revealed this to you. You did, not, you did not learn this from any other human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And verse 19 says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. See, this is where the church is first mentioned in the Bible. And I want to give you four points um, that are going to help you reverse church. 
If you're going to be the reverse church, you have to focus on the organism, not the organization. If you're going to reverse church, it's not about, well, everybody don't do that and everybody's fine with drinking and everybody's fine with sleeping around. And God said, if you don't get everybody out your mouth. So point number one, the reverse church is about the organism. Reverse church is about the organism. Me. Not the organization. So, <laughs> funny story. Uh, my beloved wife, my dear darling wife. <laughs> she is a self-proclaimed lasagna connoisseur. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll go to a steak restaurant that might have lasagna on the menu. And she'll order it. And then if it's not good, this restaurant is terrible. <laughs> so my thing, you went to a steakhouse and ordered lasagna. And because the lasagna wasn't good, then the steakhouse is terrible. And this has happened more than once. Like, I don't care where we go. If they got lasagna, she's going to order it. And if it ain't good, she's going to talk about the restaurant. And as funny as that seems, that's what many people do. They have an experience in a church with an individual and church is trash. They ain't about nothing at that church. When it wasn't the whole church, was one entity or one organism within the organization and so the whole organization gets bashed so this church interviewed some people and and said uh, why don't you go to church and one guy said I was hurt very bad at a church when I was young and I'll never go back again what he did was he took a person or an organism who hurt him and he projected it on the organization. So now, any organization, anybody that's around it, anybody that claims it, he'll never go close to because of an organism that hurt him. But may I submit to you, if an organism hurts you, betrayed you, did you wrong, it's going to take another organism to come back and restore what God is trying to build his church on. Yes. Amen. The church was built on one. He didn't call all the disciples. I'm going to just lay this thing out for you. He had 12 disciples. He didn't build a church on them. He didn't call them all together and say, hey, let's have a huddle. Uh, this is what I want to do. I want to build my church on y'all, and I really don't believe uh, that he... That he would do that. Nobody could, if he did it that way, or the reason he didn't do it that way is because now nobody can take full responsibility when things happen. So <laughs> he decided to build it on Peter. <laughs> he said, Peter, come in. Because you've had a revelation of who I am. Your name is now changed, and I'm going to build my church on you. So what you trying to say? God wants to build his church through you, not through this building, not through our fellowships or our groups. And we believe in all of that, and all of that is good. But he wants to build his kingdom through you. Somebody say me. me. Through me. That's why Hebrew tells us that we're supposed to strip off every weight that slows us down. Uh, and that means if you're not running like I'm running, I can't run with you because the church is dependent on me. Amen. Somebody say the church is dependent on me. Y'all heard how y'all say that? <laughs> yeah, the church is dependent on me. Some of y'all are scared to even say it because you don't even want to pray every day. 
You're scared to say it because you don't know uh, what that commitment looks like. But God thought enough of you to say, I'm not going to make an organizational move. I'm going to make an organism move. I want them to know that they are more valuable to me than the whole and I could build through them more than I could ever do with the whole. If they would surrender their heart and become the organism that I build the church on, I could change the world. It says strip off every weight and let us run the race with endurance that God has set before us. And how do we do that? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, our champion, who initiates and perfects our faith. These are two words I want you to understand because God wants to build the church through you, through an organism, not an organization. Some of y'all be like, uh, this church got issues and uh, others be like, yeah, sure does. But you have the power to change that person's view. How you love, how you talk. How are you patient? It said 91% of people in the church are homophobic. Now, I'm about to step on some toes, so y'all just get ready. Um, the person who's living an alternate lifestyle sexually, that's still God's child. Amen. And no matter the sin that they're in right now, they're still God's child. Amen. We talked about it a little bit on, on Tuesday. Um, no matter the situation, they're still God's child. Amen. And you won't get close enough to them to love them back into relationship. <laughs> now, just because... I mean, Just because you was a hoe in the streets and you got yourself together. Now you think you better than everybody else. And you want to judge and look down on other people. See, the reason why people ain't studying church is because we think that our little white lies, and by the way, there's no such thing, is different than somebody living an alternate lifestyle. And God says, I see sin, and when I see sin, I send my son. When I send my son and you receive my son, then I see you as I see my son. But it's gonna take some organisms to be steady in their faith enough to say, hey man, let's go out to lunch. Hey, you want to come to church with me? Amen. No, I don't go to church. I don't do that type of stuff, bro. Well, how about you come with me and I'll sit in the back with you. And anytime you feel uncomfortable, we'll get up and leave together. Amen. Now, see, why would we do that? Why would, I, why would we give up uh, or, let, or let somebody come in and stop us from getting our praise on? Well, why would I reach out and be the hands and feet of Jesus on the earth. I want you to understand that your salvation was not so you could be comfortable and get a first class ticket to heaven. Your salvation is so you could be comfortable, uh, uh, excuse me, your salvation is so that you could get dirty and know that if you messed up, he would accept you back. He said, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God, not death, not life, not anything that you've uh, ever seen. And, and many of us are sitting here with clean hands talking about, I got the V-I-C-T-O-R-Y and haven't done anything to engage. And I'm telling you <laughs> that we're going to have to reverse church. Amen. We're going to have to be a church, it's not going to be a church-wide outreach. It's going to start with the organisms. Amen. We are the organisms. We are the hands and feet. Amen. It's going to be you at your job. It's going to be you at your school. It's going to be you at Starbucks every morning when you, when you go in there and, and you intentionally remember the person's name so that at the slightest inkling, you can be so smooth with it and slip Jesus in on them. Amen. And then follow it up by call me if you need me. 
If we're going to reverse church, it's going to start with, an, with not with an organization, but with an organism. Until we engage with people, uh, we will sit and just shake our head. What's with these young people? I just can't believe our government. <laughs> I just can't, I just can't, I just can't. <laughs> and God said, I sent you to be the change. But you would rather binge and watch Netflix. And there's nothing wrong with that, because I do that sometimes myself. But when's the last time you engaged with somebody? The statistics tell us right now the church will be irrelevant in 30 years from now. When I say irrelevant, it will have no place in society. Until Gideon's army, ones who say, you know what? We may be fewer in number, but we can take out any army of any size that comes before us. Because if God be for us, he's more than the whole world against us. It takes an organism starting to engage culture. And I'm challenging you today, even as you, you say that uh, church is jacked up and the church has issues and the church is imperfect. Yeah, it's an imperfect organization, okay? Because it's full of imperfect people. But we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but until we decide we're going to be the change that God's called us to be, nothing's going to change. You have to be the change in the church that God's called you to be. And I promise on your level of influence, God will begin to change the narrative of what people think about church because they came in contact with you. The second thing we have to understand if we're going to reverse church is the reverse church values imperfection as a necessary ingredient to be used by God. Let that sink in. The reverse church values imperfection not throws people out because they're not perfect. Not judges people because they're doing things wrong. The reverse church values imperfection. Oh, you're jacked up? Great. You're going to work perfectly here. You're on your second marriage? Wow. Me too. Come on in. Oh, they hurt you? They despise you? You're addicted to what? Oh, you're self-righteous? I was too. See, if we're going to reverse church, the world thinks that if they tell us <laughs> who they are, mm -hmm. now we will reject them. But the reverse church looks at their imperfection as a necessary ingredient to be used by God. And Jesus paints this picture so well by who he chose to build his church on. Amen. He chose Peter. <laughs> Now, anybody that reads the Bible realizes that Peter was a little suspect. Okay? Like, if I was going to choose to build my church on one of the disciples, it probably would have been John. Um, it literally says he's the one that he loves. He loves you. He understands what I'm saying. But he picked Peter. And I think it was the most strategic thing Jesus could have done because Peter was the one who didn't have enough faith to stay in the boat. He got out the boat and walked on water. See, most people think that's a miracle that he walked on water. Uh, but the only reason he walked on water is because he didn't believe God would sustain him in the boat. And so he got out and God sustained him on the water. But then he started doubting. <laughs> And once he started down, he started sinking. He's like, man, Peter, come on, get back in the boat. <laughs> like, Jesus went through it with Peter, okay? Peter also is the one who found himself rebuking Jesus. And he tried to tell him that uh, he was out of line for speaking. He was speaking out about death, and Jesus checked him so quick. He said, get behind me, Satan. He changed his name again. <laughs> Peter also is that one that committed assault with a deadly weapon. <laughs> Peter is the, the one who said in Jesus' face, no matter what anybody else does, I'll never deny you. And three times before the rooster crowed, they came back with pictures and say, uh, we, we got photographs of you and Jesus. And Peter said, nah, that ain't me. Look at that nose. That ain't, that ain't even me. 
So, now watch this. No matter the imperfections in Peter's life, God still chose to use him as a foundational piece of building the church of Jesus Christ. He did it so you could know that every imperfection that you've ever experienced, every lie, every hurt, every pain, every abuse, he says, I can use all of that. If you don't think it's true, ask Paul. Paul was murdering Christians. And he had an encounter with God and changed everything in his life. I want you to hear me say this so clearly that you have to realize that God wants to use you as the organism that changes and reverses church in your area of influence. Teachers in the school system. When you're with those kids. When you're on the phone. When you're on your social media. Stop liking the things that that are making fun of the church or things that uh, people are trying to do to just blow up their status or whatever. Amen. Reverse church. Let them see something different in your love and your genuine action in the way that you serve, in the way that you care, because God wants to use every bit of your imperfection as a necessary ingredient to be used by God. Yes. Second Timothy 2.13. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Isn't that amazing? But even when we weren't faithful, God sees us and says, you know what? I'm going to still be consistent with them. I don't know how many times I made promises to God and broke them. Do I have anybody that can agree? But yet he still chooses to use us. I want you to know if you're feeling unqualified, you're feeling insecure about what you've done and they don't know my past. And if they really knew or if anybody found out um, who I am and God says, I can use all of this. Amen. Your imperfection is literally necessary to, for me to build my church. Look at this third thing that the reverse church does. The reverse church has to believe revelation changes everything. Now, some of you are like, revelation changes everything? Now, we ain't talking about the book of the Bible. <laughs> We're talking about revelation. This is what changed Peter. Peter, with all his mess ups, Jesus said, who do men say I am? And he said, you're the Messiah. That word Messiah in Hebrew means you are the promised deliverer. He said, how did you find that out? Because nobody here knows that because I haven't made the Bible yet and I haven't released the Holy Spirit into the world yet. Um, so I have not done any of that. So how did you figure that out, that I was the Messiah? He said, you know what? God must have shown that to you. He must have revealed that truth. That's what revelation means. He must have revealed some truth to you and made it and made you change. If you get revelation in your life, it will change everything. Revelation will change the narrative on everything in your life. Some of y'all been praying for miracles. You need to pray for revelation. A, re a revelation of who Jesus is, a revelation of what grace has really done for you, a revelation of what it means to love others more than yourself. If God reveals uh, truth to you, it'll change everything. And Peter's life, it changed his name. Peter went from Cephas. Did y'all know that? His original name was Cephas. He went from Cephas, then he went to Simon Peter. And when he had a revelation of who Jesus was, that God that was on the inside of him, he dropped the Simon and said, your name is Peter. Amen. I'm changing your name because that means rock. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. What God is saying is there are names that you've been called. There are names that you've accepted. Insecure, lost, side piece. Oh, you've accepted these things. And God says, if you allow me to give you a re revelation of who I am, a revelation of my grace, a revelation of what I can do with your life, 
He said, I will literally change your name. Any man that be in Christ be a new creation. The old it has passed away. Behold, look, see, I made everything new. What have you accepted that God's trying to change in your life? But it only happens when you get a revelation. Like, what does that mean? Like, that's why you come to church. You stand and worship and say, God, speak to me, because when we're singing songs like, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. We don't just pick songs because they're cool. We're picking songs to create an atmosphere that you may have a moment where God reveals his truth to you. And we and when we sing songs like you're a good, good father, it's who you are and I'm loved by you. We're hoping that somebody who's been in broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship gets revealed truth that and they can say, I know who I am. I'm loved by God because he is my father. We want you to have a revelation. This week, I dare you to pray for revelation. Husband, stop praying for your wife to change. Pray that you get a revelation of what it means to be a man in your household. It'll change everything because this is what it did in this man, man of God's life. He said that you're the Messiah, the promised deliverer. And I came to tell somebody that you've been trying to do it on your own. And God is saying, I'm I'm your promised deliverer. I'm your only way out. You've been struggling for 10 years, two months. And he said, I'm the way today you need to receive from the promised deliverer from the Messiah, the one who sees and provides, the one who has seen your faults and says, I'm still with you. If you get in a place in my presence where I can reveal uh, to you some truth, he said, I'll change your name. I'll change what people think of you. I bet Peter was sitting, uh, sitting there like Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of other disciples here and uh, whew, you want to use me? And God says, I see through the lens, I see you through the lens of who I created you to be, not through the lens of who you are right now. If we're going to be the reverse church, we have to believe that revelation changes everything. And that's why we come to church every Sunday, because we are looking for revelation. When you get revelation, it changes everything in your life. The last thing I want you to see about us becoming a reverse church is that the reverse church cannot be defeated. Some of us are so scared to be who God's created us to be, to walk in boldness, to be Romans 1 16, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for this is the power of God unto salvation. We're so scared of that because we're scared that we may fail. And we may make a mistake and we may look stupid. Let me tell you, you will. This is not a perfection calling. This is something for people to understand that I'm not living for myself, that I'm not living in this world so that people can fake like me. I'm not living so everybody can say well done to me in this temporary state. I'm looking to get a well done in eternity. When I stand before him, he's going to look at me and say, you did everything with what I gave you. And I want to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. You led where I put you. You did what I told you. You stewarded well over what I gave you. And you reversed church for hundreds, if not thousands of people in the area of influence I put you. Listen, I don't care if you're in high school, reverse church. I don't care if you're in the law office, reverse church. I don't care if you're in the gym, reverse church. I don't care if you're in a prayer meeting. Yeah, a prayer meeting, reverse church. Whatever they think church is, show them Jesus. And when you show them Jesus, there's something undeniable about that. Well, well, Pastor C, what are you saying? God said, if 
there was an impact if I could just find one imperfect person who would say, you know what? These imperfections are so cool. And I don't need a group of people. I'm an organism. And I don't care what the organization is doing. Oh, y'all can't trip with me today. It's, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So if he could find one person that would be an organism that says everything that I've gone through, going to jail, being addicted to drugs, sex, pornography, lying, all that is useful at this moment right now. God, I'm in your presence. Whatever you want me to do, God, whatever you want me to say, as I open the word, give me a revelation. Show me who you are. Watch over me. And again, your, uh, with your grace, change my thinking, change my speech, transform my mind. I will do that. And he says, <laughs> if you do that, the gates of hell and anything the enemy would try to throw against you will not prevail. What would happen if I knew that as a believer, nothing I did could fail? That, that, that if God gave me a guarantee that if you live for me, Nothing the enemy throws at you will ever be able to take you out. How would you live? And the sad narrative is that many of us would live the same way we're living today. I want to challenge you to reverse church in your area of influence. Hear me, you got to understand something so clearly that God is so enthralled with you uh, c c completing purpose. And doing everything he's created you to do. And that he said, if I made, if I made it a group effort, some of you wouldn't even do it. Amen. So I'm going to make this about you. Amen. If you take your flaws along with the greater one on the inside, everything you do for me is going to work. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And then it gives you authority. The Bible says, whatever you loose, yes. I'm co-signing in heaven. Yes. And whatever you stop, you can't have my family. You can't have my children. I will not be in poverty. Whatever you stop on earth, he says, I co-sign that too. The problem is that while we're praying for so many miracles because we haven't taken our place as the church, it says we get major keys to the kingdom. If we just become the church, we can stop and start stuff and walk in authority God's given us and reverse church. So some people may say, you know, church sucks. And let me give you a quick background of that word sucks because I know so it's, it's, it, it's a jazz term. Back in the 40s, 30s, 40s, when jazz was really popular, um, if like a horn player was really like, playing like he was just killing it they used to say oh that cat is blowing and if they weren't so good at what they were doing they said it sounds like he's sucking wind back through the horn mm -hmm. and of course as we do everything in American culture the phrase got shortened to he sucks <laughs> <laughs> so just in case you were wondering that's where it comes from but some people may say you know church sucks but not when they meet you. Now, because they're going to see the love of God. When they meet you, you're going to be in a place where you're saying, God, change my mouth. You're going to be in a process. Uh, they're going to cuss you out. And you're going to say, mm -hmm. God bless you. Because if you went off on them, then you just gave that 90% hypocrite. Amen. Wasn't she on the dance team last week? <laughs> See, that's why I told you I would never go to that church because they. But when that God bless you came out of your mouth. 
and you begin to heap love on them. And then when 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 your anger was already so evident and God said, you just reverse church. When you see the money that dropped, that twenty dollar bill that fell out of somebody's pocket. (laughs) But you didn't want to, you know, make the effort to go give it back to the person and you called it a blessing. See, y'all want, y'all, y'all want to play that like you ain't never did that before. <laughs> but God's looking for people with integrity. People that say, you know what? I don't even run, but I'm going to run and catch you and say, here, you drop this. Why? Because there's always somebody watching. The whole time, uh, it could have been somebody that knew your son. And, and they, they see you at the basketball game and, and you didn't even know they were who they were. And, and, and but God knew who they were and God was giving them a glimpse into a real belief, what a real believer looks like. Yeah. Integrity is not what you do when everybody is around. It's what you do when nobody's watching. Yeah. It's when tax season hits and, and some of y'all been claiming dependents who ain't lived in your house in 19 years. And God says, you're holding up your blessing because you don't believe I'm Jehovah Jireh, your provider. You think that Uncle Sam and that 1500 or that 3000 that you're getting on a flat and a flat screen TV is going to produce something for you. He said, I dare you to be honest and trust me and reverse church. The person doing your taxes knows it. They see you and then you invite them to church. And they don't say anything and then they graciously decline because they see the battle between right and wrong when they look at your life. So I don't know all the situations, but we all have an area we have to say, God, reverse this. It's about reversing the church. Today, as we stand... I want to pray that no longer when somebody says church sucks or the the church is full of hypocrites, we will be part of the problem that in every area of our life will be part of the solution. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these people as we lay the groundwork to what you're doing. God, give us your heart. Let us know that we're an organism just like Peter and that you want to build your church on us. And God, with our imperfections, we know that you can give us a revelation that will change everything about us. That it's not about our perfection, but it's really about our progression. And as we continue to progress in you, your word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. God, give us strength to believe you. God, give us wisdom to obey you. And Father, give us the integrity to do the things that are right when nobody's looking. Father, I thank you that you're changing us into the best version of us. And as we submit our lives to you, we believe you. We trust you. We thank you. The church is not a terrible place. Because we're the church. The church that will do it how you created it to be done. Reverse church in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. Now, I got to steal your thunder a little bit, Minister Jones. Uh, Before we go any further, there might be somebody in the room or watching online that has not yet had the opportunity to accept Christ as your Savior. So you're looking at us like, uh, you want me to reverse church? I ain't even in the church. But we want to extend that opportunity right now. It's as simple as ABC. 
First, admit that you're a sinner. Secondly, believe that Christ died for your sins. And thirdly, confess that he is Lord over your life. Now, what this does is not an instantaneous guarantee that life is going to be perfect. But what it is is an instantaneous guarantee of eternal life with Jesus Christ. What it is is a, a guarantee that if I mess up, I can still return home. I can get it right. None of us are perfect. We are all striving for perfection. We're imperfect beings with flaws and all. And as we talked about today, God can use every single one of them. So if that's you, I want you to come on up here. If that's you watching, just slip your hand up. The Lord will see it. We don't want anybody to miss out on the opportunity for salvation. Now, because I'm believing in faith that somebody is watching this either today or 10 years from now. And they're going to say, you know what? I want to be a part of the solution. So I want to pray this prayer. And we all going to join with you while you're watching this. So repeat after me. Father, Father forgive me. Forgive me. A sinner. I've missed the mark, I've missed the mark. But, I you but I thank you that you sent your son Jesus, you your son Jesus to, die just for me. to die just for me. I thank you, I thank you that, he rose that he rose from the grave, from the grave just, for me. just for me. So come into my heart. So come into my heart. Be, my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my master. Be my master. And, I'll you. and I'll forever serve you. So now I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, in my heart that, when Jesus was raised from the dead, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, I am saved. I am saved. Thank you, Lord, Thank you. for saving me in Jesus' name. And see, we're rejoicing with those in faith who may be watching this and have prayed this prayer. And if you are watching and you prayed this prayer, I need you to do me a favor and text the word SAVED to 252-627-9900. Because we have some resources we want to share with you. We have some materials. We have some devotionals that will help solidify your faith walk. And we want to share them with you because salvation is about being a part of a community. It's not about walking this thing alone. You need community with you. You need somebody that you can call on when those times get rough and you want to turn back to some of those things that you've walked away from. Because just because you prayed this prayer doesn't mean the devil's going to leave you alone. So you need a community of believers that's going to pray with you and stand with you. And we want to be that for you. And if you're in the local area, come check us out. If not, don't worry about it. We'll help you find some place where you can call home. All right. All right.